today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my community. I come from a community where it's estimated that there are about 120 languages spoken. And I could tell you from personal experience that you could get just about any type of food you'd like. But for some reason, people assume that we let our children go hungry. I come from a community where within a five minute walk, you can go from a bustling and vibrant city street to a green ravine, yet we are portrayed as a bleak ghetto. In my community, mothers care not just for their own children, but for all the children of the community. They provide support, advice, and inspiration to anybody who asks, and most of the time, we don't even need to ask, they just know. Yet, they're seen as welfare queens, and it's assumed that all we have is broken families. I come from a community where activists share their knowledge through complex rhymes, colors splashed onto a canvas, or words which resonate from their mouths. Yet people are assumed that our youth have nothing of value to say and refuse to listen to them. I come from a community where elders are right there on the front lines, advocating for change and sharing their knowledge with future change makers. Yet people assume that the only tools we have are guns, gangs, and drugs. I come from a community with a large youth population. Our youth are resilient, they are empowering, and they are inspiring. And trust me when I say that within these few blocks, we have so much passion, so much capability, and so much power. I come from the Jane Finch community. Unlike any other community, it has its flaws. There are structural forms of oppression which demean people on the daily, including violence, racism, and poverty. But this is not our only story. There is no community out there without its flaws, just as there is no community out there without its brilliance, its value, and its vibrancy. So why is it that Jane and Finch gets the rep that it does? A rep which neglects our assets and portrays us as a deficit. A rep which has, which has real and serious consequences because it's a form of stigma. And the stigma is a form of violence because after a while, we start to believe it. And that's a problem. I came to Jane and Finch with my mom when I was two. I remember in school, in high school, I was a C student, and I had no desire to be something. And I feel like this is because I was subjected to the violence of low expectations. What I mean by this is that I did not expect more from myself, and others did not expect more from me. Nobody saw me as extraordinary. Nobody saw my community as extraordinary. When I turned on the news and saw my community on the TV, we were not portrayed as extraordinary. We were portrayed as violent, deviant, and gang members. When I told people where I lived, I did not get the usual questions teenagers get. Most people get questions like, where do you want to go to school? Or what do you want to be when you grow up? I got questions like, have you ever seen somebody shot? Or do you own a gun? This is what was expected of me. And this is what was expected of everybody that I grew up with. This stigma followed me when I came to York. I remember my first week of school, and it was Frosh Week. I'd seen this on movies so many time and, times, and I was so excited to be here. That is until one question happened. One of the younger students asked one of the frosh bosses, who are senior students, where do you go for groceries? It seems like a simple question, until the frosh boss replied, there's a place on Keel and there's a place on Jane and Finch, but you don't want to go there because that is where everybody gets shot. I remember telling one of my classmates where I lived, and I watched her gasp for air, and I could literally see her expectations of me drop. This was Hare, this was York, these are students. And these people they saw as violent, as deviant, as criminals, that was me, my friends, my little brother, my family. And I'm sure all of us in this room have been stigmatized in some way. It may have been the color of your hair which made somebody assume that there was no possible way that you could be intelligent. Or maybe it was your gender which made somebody assume that you could not open the door or that you could not show any emotion. Maybe it was your religion which made somebody assume that you were a terrorist. Maybe it was your sexual orientation which made somebody assume that you could not be masculine or feminine. Or maybe it was a mental illness which made people avoid you rather than assist you. So let me ask you this. How did it feel that moment that you realized that you were a victim of stigma? Some say that it's like a slap to their face. Others say it's like a kick to the gut. For me, it felt like I was being chained down, like I, every time I tried to get up, I was pushed back down and kept down by these chains. And let me ask you another question. How did it feel the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the tenth, the twentieth, the fiftieth time when you realized you were being stereotyped? How did it feel when it stopped being a stereotype and it started being just the way things were? 
Now imagine that it wasn't just you. It was your entire community. And on the daily, you were being told that all you can ever be is less than. On the daily, you were being told that you should never try. Imagine the effects of that. I think we as people need to dig a, dip deep, but dig a dip bit deeper. When we hear these stories of communities which are innately violent or are filled with just criminals, we need to be more critical. Because we are implicit in the violence which is inflicted on the youth when they begin to see themselves as just criminal. We are responsible for this potential that's wasted when youth do not see themselves as more. And I think that we need to see that these individuals are just that, individuals, not a, not a statistic, not a label, not a stereotype, just an individual. For me, this happened in high school when one of my teachers told me that I was more, that I could be more, and that I could do more. And there are tons of youth within Jane and Finch and people within Jane and Finch who are doing this kind of thing. Rather, it's through art, spoken word, poetry, whatever it is, they're doing something to combat this stigma, to provide counter narratives, and to define themselves by themselves. I'd like to think that's what I'm doing here today on this stage. But it isn't enough if after today, if after this talk, you leave and you still think of Jane and Finch as somewhere that is innately violent, somewhere where you will get shot and somewhere where nobody good can come from. We cannot debunk the stigma alone. We cannot do it if people are not open-minded. And others need to realize that we are just people with skills and with potentials, with hopes and with dreams, and that we are equal. And that's why I think that it's so important to keep spreading this message, to let it ricochet throughout the city, throughout the country, through TV screens and from within. I would like to encourage everybody in this room today to think of Jane and Finch as the center of the universe, which is one of what something my elder calls it. He once told me that Toronto is an indigenous word which means meeting place. And today it has literally come to become a meeting place. It's the most diverse city on the world, in the world, and it's where everybody comes together to meet. But within Toronto, there is one community which is known for its racial diversity. There is one community which is known to be the home for newcomers, and that is Jane and Finch. That is where we come together to meet, and that is the center of the universe. Thank you.